Hello, everyone. Um, does anyone use Emacs? All right. Anyone else? OK. Uh, hands for Vim. Awesome. OK, and a big, big noise. So uh, heckles, please, now. <laughs> Just so we can get that out of the way. All right, as, as you all know, we can actually run Vim inside of Emacs. So uh, you could come on over. So rumor has it that Emacs has some of the best Git integration in an editor. As an Emacs diehard, uh, I've been using it since the 90s, um, I would say no, no it doesn't. But it's really good, all the same. Some of the best I've seen is an IntelliJ. Uh, and the reason why is because they stole every single possible idea from this. <laughs> plus Sublime Text, plus Fugitive. So they're pretty smart at absorbing features. And uh, in a way, that's why they're similar to Emacs, because we just suck all the features in. So the big one is Magit. That's our grand central for Git integration. But we have um, Git gutter. Probably everyone's seen some version of this in something. Sublime Text, I think, was the first thing to have this. Maybe. But it's in everything now, right? I think you've got it in Vim. You've got it in IntelliJ. And it's a just a set of changes on the side. It's pretty handy. Uh, Git Time Machine, so that's live in buffer view of the history of your file, which is also quite handy. And Smurge is a kind of secret source, actually. It's been in Emacs since the 90s, um, and it's just a nice way of dealing with conflicts. So you can just jump quickly through your file, find the conflicts, say, keep mine, keep theirs, keep them all, or revert to base. Now. BC mode is a little mode that's kind of, it's not Git specific, it's version control agnostic. So it actually works for CVS, SVN, HQ, VSS, you name it. Um, but that's for really kind of diehard people who've been using it for a really long time and have had to work on over here, over there, 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 and just really hate using anything else, like me. So let's look at Magit. This is Magit's repository view. I would recommend never ever using this because what I've done here is set up all the folders that I have Git repos in, which happens to be two that I care about. One's my workspace and one's my, <coughs> let's go up the top, uh, MXD. So the MXD is like a 5,000 commit history over 10 years. Um, the rest are significantly smaller. But it's an easy way for me to jump to my projects. But normally, I'm only going to be working on one project at a time. So let's go and look at one. Uh, it's fun. Sure, let's look at this. So this is the Magic status view. So we'll get to that in a moment. Now, to get help, you read the lovely manual um, here, which is big, pretty big, not that big, and it's searchable as a single file, which is quite nice. Also, you can press the question mark any time and you just get a, a help screen. It's Vimish in the way that it's um, modal, you press single keys at a time to navigate through. No, um, yeah, yoga. So the repository list that I mentioned, you can set this up uh, just by using the customize screen, which is a kind of an attempt at a GUI-ish um, click and fill in the forms kind of config thing for Emacs, which is fine uh, for the uh, control. I mean, aficionado, you can actually set it up with Emacs Lisp. But probably that's uh, 
a talk for another time. But you can get a big list of all your repositories, and if you have many uh, that aren't in sync, what they're going to do is not only hit all the repositories and get them for you and list them, but it's also going to check upstream with everything and then show you how many uh, up and down you're out, which is kind of useful. Not for me, but maybe for some people it's uh, something you want to be in touch with. But my tip is always know which repository you're supposed to be working with and don't, don't do that. And hence, we use magic status as a kind of home. So this is a home for a project. Uh, it's an Emacs theme. Um, <clears throat> so this is what happens when we press the key. So let's do this question mark. We get all the uh, top level kind of commands. We're going to go through most of these quickly. They're not any different from what you'd be doing on the command line. pop back here. So, fetching and pulling. So, I press uh, question mark so we get it. Fetching and pulling. Uh, luckily, I have a cursor. I can move it around. So, normally, fetch. And we can pull from origin, elsewhere, or all remotes. We can also fetch another branch or an explicit ref spec. And we can fetch from a sub-module. Normally, it's just a P. So we're going to fetch and then pull from origin. Get finished. So if ever I want to see what actually happened, I can press dollar, and I get a basically the command line output. So imagine that Magit and Emacs is always going to be trying to be a shell. It's not going to be trying to be a GUI. Now, if we wanted to pull from somewhere else, or all, it's pretty straightforward. Just hit A for all, and just fit elsewhere. And we can actually specify a remote just on the fly. Uh, we'll look at merge strategy in a moment in branches. There are other options you can set, but I think really we're going to look at that in something else. So. Yeah, so we can say prune deleted branches as we pull by doing dash P, and we set it on. <coughs> now, in every single one of these little menus, we get these common commands for setting defaults and also saving them. So they then turn into your config. Staging and unstaging. So let's make some changes to a file. So, EL. All right. So, I'm going to change some colors just for fun. Let's decrease the hue on this by steps. Let's make the red blue, because, you know, that's good. And the purple can be something else. Whoops. Let's make the purple green. All right. So we'll save that, and we'll pop back into the status. So you can notice, uh, oh, that's a bit, a bit of a shame. Can we do something about that? Yes, we can. Set the internal border to 100. OK. There we go. So um, you've got git gutter popping up there as purple. So there's changes in place. If I remove a line, I get a red. If I add a new line, I get, oh, OK. I already had lines there, so I've got to do something else. OK. All right. 
I use blue as green because I, yeah, I'm a Japanophile. Um, so off we go, and we'll go back to the status, and I'm going to give that its own buffer over here. Oh, let's try that again. And I think that border's a little bit too big. Okay. So I've got unstayed changes here. So let's go and look at our Prezo again and see what we got. So we can stage and unstage files. Stage. Unstage. S and U. I can look at the diff just by pressing tab and roll through and it'll, it will basically break it up into hunks. So we can do that. So let's stage a hunk. Right, so that big hunk gets staged and the other, sta the other hunk is not staged. So we can pop over here, it's in the staged view, and the unstaged has this. Now, let's say I want to unstage this one, just these lines, okay, unstage. So now, the unstaged changes has that line and the other hunk. So it's relatively granular. Now, if I wanted to say, oh, look, you know, kill that, I can also discard it. So when we go back to the file, actually, we're just, we're going to kill all those changes because they're useless. So we pop back into thing. So our new files, our new lines have gone. And we do one here so that we can see it nice and easily. Okay, kill those changes. And this one's there, and we're going to kill that. And now there's no changes. So, committing, it's not the most exciting thing in the world. Um, there is a git commit mode uh, that can enforce certain things for us. So let's go and change something. And I'm going to add magenta. So that's FF00FF, zero zero FF. it's a horrible color. Pop back in here. Okay, so pop there, we can see that we've got our version change and we've got the, the thing ready to go. So we're just gonna stage the whole thing. So the cool thing about commits are all the options that we've got access to in here and remembering that we can use our common commands to set defaults and save them. So if you want to stage and modify all as like as routine, then you can just do dot A, allow an empty, we can save the both. We can bypass git hooks, we can add sign off, we can reset author. We can override the author. We can sign using PGP. Um, not going to do that now. Um, we can reuse another message. And so on. And then when you go back, if you haven't saved them, none of those remain, which is nice. So we do a commit. And then we have an unpushed commit sitting ready to go to Origin Master. So we're behind it. And we can tag it. And I'm going to do the tag now because I haven't actually got it in the uh, presentation. So um, we can create, delete, or prune tags. 
So if there's no um, commits actually attached to the tags anymore, they can get removed. Um, we can do a force push on a, on a tag. We can sign a tag, and we can annotate the tag with a note. Just the normal stuff, but it's all kind of just there, which is kind of handy. So we're going to say 0.1.61, place it on master. There we go. So as I said, we're never going to push that. But we can amend it. Whoop. And no, really. So if we do want to reset it, we'll deal with that in a minute. So push. No, I'm not going to push it. Um, but we can go and look at the push. So we have push force with lease, push force, no verify, dry run. Well, we can do a dry run, right? That'll be fine. And we can also configure a bunch of variables. So what variables do we have? <coughs> Branch master description. You can actually set descriptions and set your remotes, set your merges, set the rebase mode, true, false, and you can set the push remote. Now, interestingly, um, Magic has changed its uh, push strategy or its merge strategy. Your upstream default is the branch you branched from. So you branch from master into a feature, you do your stuff, and then you think, oh, I know, I'll push to a copy of this to my origin. Makes sense, right? No, it's going to push back to master if you just do a straight push. So you must configure it first. Uh, original versions of, or the earlier versions of Magit didn't do that. And uh, there was also a versioning snafu about a year ago. So it was like a bad version number. So whenever you did an upgrade, it, Magit wouldn't be included. Um, so I discovered that the use cases that they were you know, supporting had been long, long changed from what I was used to. And um, so they had a bunch of changes like this, and it flipped me out. <laughs> um, but it's not so bad. You're pushing locally, so you can get out of it. So yeah, quick look at remoting. If I go back. Here. Okay, so a nice command log. So, remoting is on M, I think. Yeah. We can add a new remote, rename it, remove it, or set the URL. Um, if we add one, we just give it a name. So, uh, Jojo, and you set the remote URL. Um, it will remember some history, but it's not specific. So whatever we've used in other things we can do. So I can suddenly accidentally push to the wrong repeat repo. And um, so yeah, why not? So we won't do that because that might, that might make me sad later. Um, but it's all relatively straightforward. Now I did have, right at the back, at the front, actually we're not, we're not going to go there. Um, you can clone a repo uh, from inside Emacs. There isn't much in the way of help there. You simply say, I want to clone a repo, and it says, give me the URL, and that's it. So you've still got to go and find your URLs and uh, bring them in, or you know, know what they are by heart, and type them up. But it won't give you like GitHub uh, helpers, but writing one is really easy. So you can generally find that Whatever you've got there, if you want convenience to do something customized, either for your project specifically or for a specific domain like getting stuff in GitHub or Bitbucket or GitLab or wherever, uh, you can write a wrapper in you know, very, very short time. Um, of course, you've got to spend a lot of time learning Lisp first, but it really isn't that hard. And it sounds like a joke, but it's actually not. It's really easy. So let's look at the log. 
You don't believe me, do you? <laughs> this is the log. Now we can configure this to be all kinds of fancy. Um, there's some nice things in it. So if I press Control Alt, Alt W uh, on the the line in the log, it will copy my current SHA into my clipboard or into my kill ring. So I have like a cyclical clipboard. Um, so I can go and do something else, and then say, oh, you know, I want to rebase to this commit. But if I do want to rebase, I can hit rebase interactive. And I can say, despite a merge in the rebase range, no, I, d I actually want to abort. Thank you for the warning. So we're going to do a pretend rebase. Uh, we'll go back to this one. So no, really, that's never going to push. So we're going to actually drop that. So there's actually control K. So it does a nice decorated strike out for my nasty commit that I don't want. So then when I'm done, I can, yeah, if I wanted to do something like squash, I could do that. But I'm, I, I want that. So we'll do this. It's done. So now we'd want to do the prune on the tags to get rid of the old tag, but that's about it. Now, the log has all kinds of nice stuff. So I can say, like a color graph, I can show signatures, I can show diffs. So go back to the log. Now, the diff is going to, the, the log will take a little bit longer. You saw it took a couple of seconds, but we can see the diffs in line in the thing. Just, you know, it's kind of nice. But again, it's not completely radical, and there's a bunch of other tools that do this. It's just that what we do have is really nice searching and the ability to filter and put this everywhere, and every buffer behaves the same way. So, quit that. Oh, and can I ask who knows about Git log uh, searching? Cool. Cool. Dash capital G, right? Yeah. yeah. So, regardless of whether you're using uh, Emacs, this is super nice. So you can go and search every single diff in your commit log for a string or a regex. Regex? Uh, I think there's a dash. I think there's a dash dash. I think, I think there is an option for it. I normally keep it limited to strings, but you could do that. Now, I'm not going to do this because it takes a really long time. Um, but we get search changes here and search messages. But basically, it's a grep. So I believe you can do regexes, but uh, yeah, it's something to try at home. Uh, you can limit to an author, so you can just check your own stuff or that guy that keeps doing those bad commits. And you can also limit the number of commits. So the default is 256, but obviously you can you know, do what you like. Uh, you can also trace the line evolution, and I have no idea what that means. Anyone? Trace line evolution, you know this? You can see which commits change that line. Beautiful. That is awesome. Thank you. Okay, and you can also limit to a file or files, so that's pretty nice. And that just uh, adheres to globbing rules, right? Yeah. Uh, so now, like I say, I'm not going to do the, the the search for a string because it takes it's a bit too long. But do try it; it's very cool. Um, there's also change logs. Now, I never use this. But we can do a action, refresh. OK, never mind. We'll skip that. So resetting. OK, well, we could have done the, the rebase interactive to get rid of that nasty commit with the reset. 
Uh, so we'll do another nasty commit quickly, and we'll reset it for fun. So I'm going to just take out all my bright colors, pop back into the status, and then we'll stage it and commit and say, what am I up to? Okay. So what the hell am I up to? So I want to reset that, so I can just do a reset head. Um, which will give me back, oh, no, I don't have it's stupid. Um, oh, without diffs, please. Go back. Minus U. Okay. Now, I think here I can do a reset to here. Yeah. Okay, and then if I quit there, then I get back to the stage thing. So obviously that's fine. And then I can just kill that normally. Or I can do a reset hard. So I do shift X and it's a hard reset. When you do a shift, uh, shift X, you get a bunch of options. So you can do that kind of stuff. Branching and checkout. B. No, let's branch. So here I would need to, so these are unset. So when I do create a new branch, it's going to make it master. So we're going to say, we can check out, or we can just check out a new branch. So we're going to say, oh no. Oh, <coughs> sorry. Let's try that again. Up, up, up. Okay. Um, branching. And C, create. Okay. So, sorry, this is uh, create from. So where, where are we routing our branch from? So it doesn't default to where you are. Um, you can specify that. So, but it will provide the default from where you are. So we'll create the Ono branch. And it says push is missing. So they've changed it yet again. So if I want to try and push, push Ono onto, so. It remembers that we set Jojo as our last remote. So it's going to try and do that. So it's actually changed again from this master or pushing back to the parent branch, which is good. But we've got the wrong one. So, well, that's news to me. That's good. Hands, uh, who knows how to use branches? <laughs> Okay, all right, okay. I thought that would be a full hands. Um, I think this is slightly out of scope, but um, we can just diverge from whatever the current line of development is, start working on the files in the repo, change, commit, 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 push to a remote, push to many remotes, but we're not on the main track anymore. Or on any other track, we're on our own little track. And Git's cool because it can converge these changes back through various strategies, uh, merging or rebasing. Um, hands for rebase. Everyone know how to rebase? Shall I do this? I guess I should do this quickly. So um, let's do it like this. <coughs> This is tricky. All right, let's go to scratch. Okay, look at this wonderful diagram. And every time I do plus, I'm finishing some work. Okay, so I'm adding a commit. So we're going to just call these um, 
One, two, three, four, five, six. And that's me working on these pieces, right? So we'll give those proper names in real life, but we're going to just number them. Now, if I was to, say, start branching off here. Ah, oh, that's going to be fun. OK, luckily, it's going to let me do stuff. So we're going to say A. All right, so I'm going to start doing stuff commits here, and I want them to be one and two and whatever. But I'll, I'll obviously give them real names in real life. But uh, three. Now, if I happen to want to merge back with, uh, let's call this um, origin, and this is me. Okay. Now, there's two ways I can do this. I can merge, in which case I would create a commit that basically gets merged back into six, which is normally fine. There's a lot of people that don't like this. And the main reason is, I think, is because it's messy. So you get these tracks all diverging, and it's crazy. Now, what I would like to do, so I'm not going to do a pure rebase here. I'm going to do something called a squash and then a rebase. So I've done all this work on me, and I've gone from A to B. Okay, And that's basically a piece of work. The rest of them is what we would generally think of as uh, work in progress. And we probably don't need to keep those separate. Now, this is a large topic of controversy in the Git community, so I don't want to say anything definite. Use whatever workflow you like, because it's your choice, or your team's choice, or your boss's choice. And never let it be said, I'll get out of the way of that shit. So I don't want that commit anymore, and I don't want that commit anymore, and I don't want that commit anymore. And what I want is this to be a single commit. So I would squash it. So all the work contained in that branch is now here. And that's effectively what a rebase is. Now, the point of the A here is this is where we started, right? Was it one or two? Because I've forgotten. Anyway, um, <coughs> it was two, right? Yeah. Anyway. Um, when we squash, time, oh, that's not fair. Time goes backwards. So the squashes do this. Because the timestamp on A uh, and the earlier commit gets to be the, the parent of the other ones. So what it would do when you squash them, so you remember I picked and dropped my fake commit? That one was afterwards, so it would have gone back in time. Now, all these other guys are working on two, three, four, and five, and six, and these are, these are pieces of work. They may have some effect on the files that I've changed in my journey from A to B. So what I want to do is catch up and not jump in on them and make a big mess. So. It's clean, again, controversial and open for discussion, to group all that work together into one piece. So we squash, and then we do something called a fast forward, which is basically another name for a rebase in most people's books. And we end up here. And then what that does is become and we kill that branch. Was that clear? I've never done that before. I've drawn bloody rebase diagrams on windows and whiteboards and 
done interpretive dances. So it's, you know. <laughs> so hopefully that was instructive. If not, I'm sorry. So what have we, what have we got left? Oh, Lord, submodules. So I guess the room also is... <laughs> submodules, hands? <laughs> Was that just like, no? <laughs> you hate them, right? Yeah. Okay, and uh, the other one everyone loves is subtrees. These are quite new, relatively speaking. Well, two years, right? Anyone? Yeah, you know. You love subtrees. So... They're not really, uh, so, so opinion, right? Uh, are they interchangeable? <coughs> they are not. Good, thank you. Um, and I think I said something like that here. They are for distinctly different purposes. Now, submodules, oh, this is far too much. How are we doing on time? Are we good? Yeah. Okay. Um, Submodules. I want to include another library in my code base. Um, in most cases, this is a really bad idea. You want to just have that dependency as something that you import at build time, and that's a separate thing. But there's a possible set of reasons why you'd want to include it in your code base, uh, so that other people can check it out, and they all check it out together, and it's, but you will lock your code to a specific version of the module code. That's important. It's not just like a random download of that repo. So there's a need to sometimes update and to sync and to fetch and also to de in it and get it out of it. It's definitely not a topic that I can cover with an interpreted dance. So I stress the importance of finding out about them and probably avoiding them as much as you possibly can, right? <laughs> no! Manage your dependencies in a better way, I would say, unless there's no choice. Subtrees are when your code that you are taking care of is split into pieces and you're kind of developing them all in the fly together. It's a really bad way to do it, I think, as well, um, but it it's a possible strategy. And the world is full of different strategies, so um, find out about these things as well. I really don't want to teach you anything about subtrees because what I could teach you is about that much. Because I don't know. But as always, uh, whoops, okay, Oop. not that one. Where are you gone? Okay, this one. Submodules and subtrees are both covered. And we can do things like squashing and ignore joins and rejoins and prefix and add messages to our merge and annotate and branch onto and all kinds of stuff. But I definitely don't consider it a playground for fun. And that's the end of submodules and subtrees. I really don't even know why I've put this in here. It's just to look cool, right? Um, back in the olden days, before we had Git, um, before we even had subversion, we would do things with a version control tool called CVS. Uh, I can't even remember what CVS stands for anymore, but it was horrible. Uh, if you created a folder, you couldn't delete it. Um, if you wanted to merge things together, you best get like a massive like thing of purple drink and codeine and you'd be okay. Um, it's just horrible. But one of the ways we cope with it was by creating patches. So this has been a constant in almost every version control system is what a diff looks like. Diffs look the same no matter what version control system you're using unless they've really gone off the reservation and they want their product to just disappear. So if you're using Mercurial or Bazaar or Git, Subversion, whatever, a dot .patch file, which is basically the text that makes up a diff, will apply to every single one of those repos. 
So even if you're not working on the same version control system as somebody else, hey, share your patches. And what Emacs does, because it's kind of the workflow that a lot of Emacs developers have been using for a long time, the core uh, product developers, is to send a patch via email to uh, a branch manager or a release manager and to go, yeah, that looks good, and, and merge it. Basically like a very, very old school Stone Age version of a Git pull request on GitHub. In fact, they look so similar, it's scary. Point being, Emacs makes this almost painless and almost as much fun as a pull request. And we know how much fun pull requests are. But I think patch files are probably showing me my age. So, um, this is outside of the magic status area. We can do git blame inside of our file. So let's go and look at something. Hopefully we can find something I didn't work on so we can blame somebody else for something. All right, there's a bunch of upstreams on here. Oh, wow, okay. So let's go and look. All right, we'll look at CLS report in Hammerspoon. If you use OSX, Hammerspoon is awesome. So this is uh, basically window management auth auth uh, automation. And if you like driving things with a keyboard, it's super cool. Now, <clears throat> so there's nothing special about this. It's just a normal text file with Objective-C in it. And if I say magic blame, I then suddenly decorate it with uh, <laughs> little things that explain that Chris Jones worked on this and he doesn't like doing atomic commits. <laughs> and what else we got? Actually, forget headers. Let's try modules. No? Okay. Huh. Current. Really? That is surprising. Oh, never mind. I'm in the wrong place. So, dot, dot M. Now, uh, this would be better. Okay. Actually, it would implementation code would be nicer. So, magic blame. All right, still no atomic commits, but never mind. Um, so, we can see A.S. McGill and Chris Jones have been working on this feverishly adding uh, some functions that are exposed to Lua, which is nice. And we can go and look directly at the commit and roll through everything that he committed all together, which to me looks a bit unrelated, but we can see basically whenever there's a line in our code that makes no sense, we can go and look at it. And we can view the commit, and then from the commit message, decide how insane the, the developer was when they committed it. Which is always a worry. So, normally though, when you do a git blame, you'll find that you did it. <laughs> or at least I do. But that's because I can't remember what I did on Friday. Git gutter. I think we've covered this. Oh, oh no, it's not working. Okay, it's working. Right, so I can do um, git gutter pop-up, so I can view the change. It's not the nicest pop-up. We do have choice of pop-ups, but I honestly don't use this very much, so. We can also revert the hunk. And say revert, yes and it's gone, or rather it's back. But it's convenient because you can change your files back when you're actually in them, rather than going to somewhere else and going, what was I doing? So let's have a quick look at this. This is the Git time machine. And this is just my work, so we're gonna go back, back, back into time, 
2016, September. Well, we can go so far back. 2015, July. Hopefully we'll see some stuff disappearing in front of us. Oh yeah, that should, that should disappear in a minute. Yeah, all those disappeared. And it's a much earlier version back in, well, it's version one. This is so much more meaningful when you're actually looking at a file that you wrote. But effectively, it's going to save you popping into GitHub or whatever and doing a click the history button and then scroll through and press page to go to the next page. Uh, so you can just roll through. Again, I stress that, you know, obviously if you're a keyboard aficionado uh, and you like Vim, Fugitive has similar tools. That's awesome. You should use that. Emacs generic version control commands. We can revert, view revisions, uh, view the root diff, git pull, various things, tons and tons of stuff. Um, but it's not so visually there for you. Uh, we can do control XV, and because I have which key on, I can see all the commands. So we've got two pages. Whoops. Control XV, control H. Next, uh, not so many. So we've got commit, and push, and diff, various things. Okay, smudge. Who's done a um, conflict resolution? Cool. How much pain was it? Ten. How many commits were in the rebase? Or in the merge? A lot. Right. Keep your branches very short-lived, please. And then you don't have to do this, and you don't have to worry about how good the tools are. If you, if you feature branch, aim to have that feature done today. If you can't, rebase at the end of the day so that you keep up to date with everyone on master. So pull master back and rebase it. So you pull forward. Otherwise, you have 30, 40, 60, 100, 300 commits to reconcile with your branch. And that's not good. But sometimes you inherit some work from someone who's insane. And then you have to deal with this. And it's none of your fault. So. Having good tools is really, really helpful. So let's go and have a look, see at this. So now I'm ill prepared. I didn't get this bit done. Let's pop into Google and grab ourselves a conflict diff and a conflict file git. Let's see what we can get. All I need are these little things here. So we're going to pretend this is ever so novel and there's lots and lots of different changes. But imagine you've got all of these commits, uh, sorry, all these conflicts to deal with buried in your code. It's not fun. Uh, we're going to say that this is just marked down. No, not marked down. Let's make it Ruby for fun. OK, so it sort of almost looks like real, real code. So we're going to say uh, switch on smerge mode. Uh, <coughs> so I have a special, whoa, I have a special set of shortcuts. So these aren't defaults. Uh, but I can go to the next one, the previous one. I can keep all, I can keep mine, and I can keep the other. And so just going down, it's going to jump straight there. So if there's any intervening lines, don't care. 
they're not conflicted, so who cares, right? Now, I always want to have mine because obviously I do the best work. <laughs> and then when I've been drunk the night before, I always want to keep the other guys. So we're going to go and say other. Except I quit the mode. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, there we go next so yeah it won't let you just jump straight through them more like that and oh and mine is better there there's there's now I'll grant you maybe you can't read all the differences and all the nuance between them but chances are you're going to know that theirs was probably the right stuff or yours was the right stuff. There will be some cases where it's not, but you want to get to those quickly. So having a tool that you can just jump straight to the next diff, it really helps. And then we can have a result file. There are eight planets, right? Pluto, anyone? Okay. Now, in closing, and I did get to this at the beginning, magic is not the reason you should use Emacs. So why should you? It's because it's super programmable. If something else comes out that has as much flexibility and is built in the same language you customize it with, get it. But that's not Atom. It's not Sublime. And sadly, it's not Vim. If there was something else that had an even nicer language than Lisp, I would use that. But here's the thing. I've been using Emacs since I was in my 20s. I'm not in my 20s now. I didn't even start using Lisp with it until I was in my 30s. If I hadn't invested 10 years in customizing it and basically writing an editor with it, I probably wouldn't use it. But then these guys, led by Sylvain Brenner in Canada, built Spacemax, which is basically Vim, but with Emacs Lisp as a back. So if you do use Vim, you might want to check it out, because it's really good. Oh, by the way. Um, even when it's not in Vim mode, you can actually do some pretty sweet editing stuff. And I have a thing called Emacs GIFs where I noodle away and record about 70 different little videos so you can watch it do stuff. So take a CSV file, for instance, and then pivot it. So there's the fields and there's the values. Or something else, or this, or that. Oh. It's base max. And um, any questions? It's around about two years old now. It's pretty mature. I would say it's still maturing, but they've done a pretty good job. The key features are this extensive Vim mode style uh, customization and packages that target specific languages. So if you use Python or C or Ruby or whatever, they basically have grouped packages together. Now, I don't use it, and I have problems with it, but I think it really benefits from having a, big, a really big and vibrant community behind it who are building a, a single config, but that serves many purposes. So um, one thing that Emacs has lacked for all the time that's been around is a very, very active community. There's a lot of uh, crotchety old guys who don't like change and really, really resist changing their, their crooked hand shit. Um, it's one of the reasons why it took me 10 years to really adopt it as my daily driver, but it's so powerful I can ignore that this, the main maintainer or the former maintainer likes to eat his toenails in public. 
and has very strange beliefs about all sorts of stuff. Anyway, thank you. That's a wrap.